Sup y'all, and welcome to Industrialization and Global Integration, Unit 5, Part 8. In this video, we're going to continue looking at the expansion of industrialization and see the changes that it made in society. To understand how this time period was truly revolutionary, we have to look at how the social order was uprooted. For millennia, most industry was aligned according to the domestic system. People typically worked from their homes, and production was done through skilled labor, often with a master craftsman taking on an apprentice for years. They also organized into guilds for economic protection. People were paid for the number of items they completed. With the industrial system, also referred to as the factory or wage system, society and labor were radically changed. The labor was compartmentalized and mostly consisted of unskilled labor that was much cheaper. Wages were based on the number of hours you worked, and men almost always received higher wages. They typically worked very long hours, from 12 to as many as 16 hours in a day, and this was for six days a week. Conditions were sometimes unsafe, and there was initially no insurance if you were injured on the job. Unions and strikes were initially outlawed. And child labor was legal, with children as young as five years old working in factories or mines. Now let's look at how industrialization and society adjusted as we moved on to the second industrial revolution. This cartogram shows you the relative global wealth in 1900 as measured by gross domestic product. Clearly, you can see the immense wealth of Western and Northern Europe compared to all other regions. They experienced a first mover advantage due to being the first states to engage in massive industrialization. However, soon after Britain had begun the first industrial revolution, and even while it was diffusing to other areas of Europe, secondary hearths emerged as well. The United States started industrializing before the end of the 18th century, bolstered by vast natural resources and cheap labor reinforced through massive immigration. Other secondary hearths cropped up in Russia and especially what is modern-day Ukraine. And by the middle of the 19th century, Japan engaged in its own industrial revolution the first state to do so on the Asian continent. By the time 1870 rolled around, the calculated work done through steam power exceeded that done by animal and human power combined, indicating a significant shift in production and productivity. This marked the start of the Second Industrial Revolution, sometimes called the Technological Revolution, the Age of Synergy, that spanned from 1870 to the start of World War I in 1914. Now, synergy refers to the cumulative benefits of working together, essentially meaning the creation of something that is greater than the sum of its parts. And that synergy came about as a result of a multitude of technologies, such as the proliferation of electric power, which predated this era, but became more ubiquitous with the expansion of alternating current, which is what powers the vast majority of global electric grids, since its energy dissipates less over distance as compared with direct current. Through electric power, major improvements in communication technology were invented. First, with the telegraph, which predated the Second Industrial Revolution. But communication was improved even further later on with the invention of the telephone and then the radio. This led to what has sometimes been referred to as the annihilation of distance. In reality, distance still mattered, as it certainly still does today. But it mattered less, enabling people to connect and work together in synergistic ways that were not possible before. Other technological inventions predated this era, but came into fruition during the Second Industrial Revolution. For instance, inventions that greatly aided the growth of urbanization. The Bessemer process made steel much stronger through a technique of forcing air into molten iron to burn off impurities. Combine the improved steel with passenger elevators, and you can then have skyscrapers. I mean, think about the annoyance of walking up just a few flights of stairs. The incandescent light bulb, invented by none other than Thomas Edison, lit up the world, making it possible to illuminate entire cities and homes. And it was much safer than using oil lamps. The means of transportation improved substantially as well, reducing distance decay with the introduction of automobiles and road systems by the late 19th century, and with the invention of powered flight by the start of the 20th century. By the 1800s, modern mass production began replacing skilled workers and craftsmen with legions of unskilled workers assembled in factories. Mass production requires three elements. Division of labor, which had existed since the dawn of man. Just think of the term hunters and gatherers. As the name states, they divided their labor amongst themselves. 
You also need interchangeable parts, which didn't become massively used until the 1800s. And lastly, the assembly line is needed, in which machines and unskilled workers can perform relatively simple and repetitive tasks with minimal movement, thereby dramatically improving efficiency. Combining all these technologies helps explain the revolutionary impact of the age of synergy. Railroads allowed the cheap transportation of materials and products, which led to the formation of factories that produced a multitude of goods. Electricity enabled factories to become more efficient and for cities to expand, supported by communication networks and cars that were increasingly mass-produced, making transportation over great distances even cheaper. So now let's turn our attention to Russia, a region that had lagged far behind the process of industrialization. Now, Tsar Alexander II succeeded Nicholas I of the Romanovs in 1855. He realized Russia had to industrialize, and this was virtually impossible with 25 million peasants still living in bondage to landlords. So, in 1861, he signed the Emancipation Edict, providing the serfs with freedom and some land. In turn, the freed serfs had to pay taxes to compensate the nobles. Also, due to many revolts previously, Alexander II realized that it was better to abolish serfdom from above than to wait for the time when it would begin to abolish itself from below. Additionally, the many serfs would provide the cheap labor needed for industrialization and building up Russia's infrastructure of railways. Other reforms were made, providing each province with zemstvos, or elected assemblies empowered to manage local concerns. Nonetheless, poverty was still rampant, and a radical socialist group called the People's Will attempted to assassinate the Tsar several times to start a massive revolt. They finally succeeded in 1881 when rebels threw a bomb at his carriage, failing to kill Alexander II at first, but wounding several others. When he stepped out, another rebel threw a bomb at his feet, mortally wounding the Tsar. However, rather than sparking a revolt, they only encouraged his son and successor, Alexander III, to seek revenge and increase repression. Many reforms were rolled back, the state took control of the Zemstvos, and censorship, secret police, and exile became more commonplace once again. A policy of Russification or forced nationalism was also instituted. All citizens were required to learn the Russian language and follow Russian customs, including the Christian Orthodox religion. People and groups who did not follow these commands were persecuted. For example, several pogroms occurred, which were riots organized against the Jews. This lithograph shows U.S. President Teddy Roosevelt telling Nicholas II to stop the oppression of the Jews. Now, in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, the Russians were surprisingly soundly defeated at the hands of the Japanese, losing virtually their entire Pacific and Baltic fleets. This led to riots and massive protests throughout Russia. The most infamous incident took place on Bloody Sunday, on January 22, 1905, thousands of peaceful demonstrators marched toward the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg to petition the Tsar to end the war and grant laborers better working conditions. Unbeknownst to them, the Tsar wasn't even there, but they were greeted by thousands of soldiers, of whom many fired shots into the various crowds, killing hundreds of men, women, and children. The ensuing revolution of 1905 forced Nicholas II to make changes or face annihilation. He reluctantly signed the October Manifesto, guaranteeing the protection of civil liberties. It also formally recognized the Duma, an elected legislative assembly, and the Manifesto also provided for universal manhood suffrage. While these reforms halted the revolution, they were only somewhat followed by the Tsar, and only a few minor changes remained. Autocracy and oppression persisted until, throughout, and even after World War I. Bad news. The fog is getting thicker. And Leon's getting larger. 